Written on the pages of the great book of nature lies a truth so profound that it has beckoned men and women throughout the ages to seek its wisdom. We will continue this quest and study many stories of humanity as we search for this light. On this journey, we will examine philosophy, religion, and science to uncover the hidden mysteries behind myth and legend using the symbols of Universal Freemasonry. Welcome to Legends of the Craft. Welcome back to Legends of the Craft. Brother Matthias, it's a pleasure to be back in the studio with you again. Oh man, it's really exciting to be back in the studio for my favorite topic, the Book of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's, it's a religious book. It is. It, it is actually one of those rare works of fiction that reads like a religious text. So to help us discuss this and unpack this incredibly dense piece of literature, I have Brother Patrick Alessandra. Greetings. It's my first time here, and I'm excited to contribute. And I have Brother Jonathan Dinsmore. Hello. Yes, I'm super excited to talk about Dune with you guys. These are two, uh, two Dune experts right here. <laughs> Much better versed than you or I. Oh, absolutely. These, these two have been studying the scrolls of Dune for, for many moons now. Um, Dune, you know what, Brother Jonathan? I'm going to let you uh, kick us off with a, a brief description of the story of Dune, and then we'll get into how all this ties into masonry. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. I'll just kind of place the, re the uh, listener in the Dune universe briefly here. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to get into the story, but I think uh, the first thing to, that's useful to talk about is the actual context of Dune. Uh, Dune takes place in the f uh, distant future, uh, actually thousands of years in our future, um, and the situation with uh, the Dune universe is that the humans and machines, basically Terminator happened on a, in a sense, but in an interplanetary sense. And the humans won the war is the, is the short version. And uh, so as a result of that, they outlawed any sort of thing, any sort of computer which, or machine which resembles a human mind. You're referring to the Butlerian Jihad, correct? Correct, yes. That was the Butlerian Jihad. And because of that, they outlawed any sort of, quote, thinking machines, which means that essentially humanity had to continue exploring space and uh, advancing and progressing without the aid of machines. And that's a very essential element of the Dune universe that some people might pass over. So I think it's important to note. I think it's a, an interesting sci-fi series because we're dealing with the future but this isn't like full of like crazy technologies right you know this isn't star trek yeah, this isn't star wars they're fighting with swords yeah you know? essentially yeah. it's yeah. a huge break for most sci-fi it's mm -hmm. very unique yeah in a sense it's it's an interesting mix because there are actually laser guns and like force fields but there are no like self-aware robots or anything like any intelligent computers or anything like that um, so that sort of places us in the Dune universe a little bit. I mean, I could probably go into infinite detail, but just to discuss how the series begins, um, basically what, what we're, it, what the situation in Dune is that we have space feudalism. So there are various roy royal houses which rule over various planets, and they live within an imperium. You know, it's an interesting point, Brother Jonathan, about space feudalism, because it comes about in the absence of liberating technologies. The fact that robots and robotics and personal computing has vanished is what has caused the galaxy of humanity to revert back to feudalism. Right, that's correct. And it creates a sort of interesting co combination of uh, you know, futuristic technology with things that we would look at as archaic, such as you know, dukes and kings and queens ruling and stuff like that. Um, so the series begins us with Paul Atreides, part of the Atreides family. His father is Duke Leto Atreides, uh, and Paul's mother is a Bene Gesserit. Now, uh, to get into the Bene Gesserit a little bit, just briefly, uh, basically they are a group of uh, women who have sort of evolved themselves. They're a semi-secretive organization, a secret society, if you will, that's not necessarily secret. Uh, that have evolved themselves to have certain abilities, um, such as the ability to move more quickly than humans are normally able to, and certain control over the elements of their body. Um, so they're sort of superhuman-ish, and uh, his mother is one of these, and he's training him, breaking with tradition by training him 
in uh, the Bene Gesserit arts. So we begin with Paul Atreides and his family, and they are moving to Dune, the planet Dune. So the significance of planet Dune uh, is an important subject to discuss as well, having to do with the significance of spice. And again, this harkens back to the lack of computer technology, because uh, as we mentioned, this is an interplanetary empire. So they are obviously traveling through space. And the way that they do that to make up for the fact that they don't have machines to guide their faster than light travel, uh, because, you know, if you end up in the wrong, you could end up in the middle of a planet or somehow, you know, those sorts of things. So they utilize this substance called the spice, which allows specialized class of human beings called navigators, which are, again, uh, sort of evolved in a different direction, uh, who swim in spice gases uh, to see into the future. So the spice has this ability to awaken this quality called prescience in people and it allows them to see into future timelines and this is how they travel through space so this is why the planet dune is so significant because it's the only source of the spice so paul atreides and his family are uh, relocating to dune and uh, just to sort of very uh, briefly not get caught in the details and briefly cover the story um, Paul's family, there's a plot, a conspiracy to, uh, to kill Paul's father, uh, and uh, basically this happens, there's a sort of uh, plot against them and his family, uh, their uh, ducal reign sort of temporarily falls, and uh, Paul and his mother flee into the desert uh, where they join the Fremen. With House Atreides destroyed, and it was House Harkonnen, that plotted against the Atreides. Yes. Um, it signifies a change here. This is a change in the order of things. And there are existing myths and legends on the planet Dune of a savior that would come to free the Fremen, the native-born desert people. And the Harkonnens, who had been in control of the planet prior to the Atreides, thought there were very few of them scattered around the planet. Well, Paul comes to find out there are actually hundreds of millions of Fremen hiding in small rock, you know, groves in the middle of the desert. And not only are there hundreds of millions of them, but they are fierce warriors, greater, in fact, than the emperor's elite soldiers called the Sadu Kar. Yes, and these are people that the Imperium sort of looks down upon or considers to be like, you know, just uh, primitive desert people, but they're actually quite powerful and skilled in battle. Um, and so, uh, essentially, and another interesting point is that this uh, sort of messianic prophecy that exists with them has actually been planted by the Bene Gesserit because one of their purposes is to be builders of religions. And so they plant these sort of prophecies in various cultures as almost like safety mechanisms so that they, being privy to the prophecies, can take advantage of them as they see fit in certain situations. And what's that program called? Uh, uh, Missionaria Protectiva, or, yeah, is that correct? Missionaria Protectiva. Yeah. Missionaria Protectiva, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Missionaria Protectiva. Right, so Paul and his Bene Gesserit mother take advantage of this prophecy and basically come into power with the Fremen. Uh, the, they make friends with the Fremen, they gain their alliance, and they rebel against the Empire, and the Fremen warriors actually fight off the Imperial Sardukar, which are widely regarded to be the most, uh, you know, the, the best fighters in the Imperium. But there's something that happens to Paul in order for this to take place, right? Yes, correct. So uh, part of what they have to do is that Paul, and actually his pregnant mother, which becomes significant later, Paul has to, uh, and his mother, have to drink the water of life. Uh, which is a concentrated spice mixture. Now, the Fremen consume spice in small amounts on a regular basis, and the Bene Gesserit consume spice to extend their life and also expand their uh, mental capabilities. So depending on the amount you take, it has all sorts of effects. But if you take this concentrated mixture, uh, referred to as the water of life, then you basically either die, or if you have the Bene Gesserit ability to transmute the elements within your body, you survive and you are taken on... Uh, what we might consider to be like a psychedelic journey or something where you are able to see further into time. Um, I believe in the, the Bene Gesserit, standard Bene Gesserit, whenever they do it, they uh, gain access to their uh, 
to uh, something about the past. I'm, their I'm, other I'm, memory. Their other memory. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I think an important point to make here is that uh, no man has successfully taken the water of life. They die. But Paul succeeds. Right. Having been trained and thus becomes the Quisatz Haderach. Quasat Haderach. Quisatz Haderach. Quasi Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking with Quisatz Haderach. <laughs> Quisatz Haderach. Thank you, Brother yeah, Axel. Yeah, yeah. They don't like my accent, but you know, that's fine. <laughs> but that's brother, brother Matthias, it, there is an interesting uh, uh, Hebrew translation of this, right? It means the shortening of the way. Mm. in Hebrew. I didn't even know that. That's amazing. Yeah. And so we're talking about quickening evolution here. So it's, it's a shortcut towards extending our lives down the path, which we'll find out is called the golden path later on. You know, and it's, it's very interesting to me that this is precipitated by a, a quasi or quizzats um, <laughs> psychedelic experience, you know, because this is something that when you look into the ancient mystery traditions is present in, in every initiation. It's, it's always preceded by uh, the taking of some kind of psychedelic compound, not only um, primitive shamanic initiations, but uh, very organized ritualistic institutions like the Elu Eleusinian Mysteries. The candidates for the Eleusinian Mysteries were given a psychedelic compound in order to kind of um, precipitate the experience that they were about to go through. Right, yes. So the water of life is very much like that, um, but also provides some sort of superhuman capabilities on the uh, drinker as well. So uh, having drank the water of life, uh, they stage a rebellion against the Imperium. Um, long story short is that they succeed, I suppose, uh, without getting too bogged down in the details. And uh, then we progress you know, on into the, uh, the rest of the books, which just get more and more fascinating and are filled with a series of false protagonists, which we think Paul is the main character, then it turns out changing to someone else. That's another thing to talk about. Essentially, I believe that this story is a story of the perfect man. This is a story of trying to create the perfect human being. And what Paul represents is the ability not only to channel the memories of his male ancestors, but also the female ancestors. And this is what the Bene Gesserit want. They want this Quasac Hatterach who can essentially access both sides, go back to the first ancestors, and pave the way of human progress. Well, it's what they think they want. Because <laughs> as it turns out, as the, as the book progresses, this power of the combination of male and female human energy uh, in total, the way that Paul represents it, is a dangerously uncontrollable force. It's, it's a power that this galaxy has not encountered before, and the systems that were set up prior to its emergence don't exactly know what to do with it. But I think that's what makes it perfect. It destroys stagnation. It propels humanity forward. The Imperium is essentially stagnant at this point and decaying upon itself. Right, and this is a major theme of the entire Dune series, is that essentially the stagnant uh, structure, the comfort, the safety of uh, the Imperium, and even you know later empires, it ultimately is a dead end. And that the, the sort of, I guess you could say, the magic and the evolution happens where uh, chaos sometimes ensues and mixes things up in a sense. It's, it's all about change. It's... One theme throughout the entire book is that any system, no matter how good it is, ultimately becomes a prison for those inhabiting it. Like even Paul, he's the perfect man, like you said, but and he destroys all this stagnation. He changes everything, but then he gets trapped in his own stagnation, in his own rhythm, and he has to be overturned eventually by his son. Right, because with the ability to see into the future so uh, so thoroughly, he, you know, it's inevitable that you will cre that he will rule and create power structures, and then those get again back to the original problem. This is masonry, right? I mean, we're members of a craft, and what is the purpose of our craft? Evolution, progress, change. By no means are we perfect. Our craft has never been perfect, but we're slowly refining it through time. We're polishing it. It's a rough ashlar to be made perfect. And I'm not sure it will ever become perfect, but we have to attempt to make it perfect. And we use what? Working tools, right? And what are these working tools? Working tools are different ideas. They're different 
modalities in which we can attempt to refine humanity. And this is something that uh, Frank Herbert, the author, takes great pains to lay out in the um, surrounding kind of collage of characters because the the main character, at least in the first book, is Paul, but there are, there are ideological forces around him that persist into the later books. You have the Bene Gesserit, then you have the Bene Tleilax. There are these organizations that surround Paul that represent these different ideologies. The same way as in humanity, we have these, these ancient ideologies competing with newer ideologies of the 21st century, for example. And so the same ideological conflict that we see in the world today is represented in Dune because what Herbert is doing is he's tapping human archetypes on a grand scale, which is why I agree with you when you say this is religious fiction, right? It's not just a sci-fi story. This is almost on the level of a religious text because it deals in human archetypes the same way masonry does. With it, It's a grander perspective than the regular world is accustomed to. And frankly, I think Frank Herbert may have actually been a mason or he at least studied masonry because there's too many correlations that i don't think can be coincidence i think the Benny Gesserit are male craft masons he made them all women but it's the same it's 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 a group that's one gender and that always is limiting them they never can quite get what they want because they're cut off from the other sex right mm -hmm. that's an excellent mm -hmm. point yes and they, um, they wanted to build in that male energy, that opposite gender energy with Paul. That's why they were working, they were working towards creating him. But they wanted him to control, to make them perfect, rather than as an equal. And that was their undoing, because he turned against them and overturned everything they were working for. Right, so there are clear correlations we can see in the uh, progression of the male craft and the uh, evolution of co-masonry as well. Another interesting point and I'm not sure this is in the first book. This may be in the Children of Doom, which is the third book in the series. But um, Leto II, who's a character we have to introduce, this is actually the son of Paul, Paul Moidib, and he eventually becomes what is known as the God Emperor, my favorite character. Me too. He actually, on the planet Doom, there are these worms, right? They're the ones that make the spice. And the Fremen call them Shai Halud. They're God to the Fremen. Well... Leto II, as a young boy, essentially is consumed by sand trout, which is the, the children of these these. They're the uh, precursor worms. to the, the worms, yeah. And he becomes half man, half worm. And as he gets older, he actually becomes more worm. And he lives for over 3,000 years. And we'll get into that part of the story in a second. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because he goes back to his first ancestor. He's having a conversation. He's like, my first ancestor was on Earth, which nobody really knows Earth exists. This is sort of a myth of the past. They know, they know it as old Terra. But there's like, they know that the Butlerian Jihad happened, that, that, that humanity had a single origin. But our history, like the past 3,000 years of human history, is so far in the ancient past to them that it, it has taken on the mantle of mythology at this point. And this first ancestor, who is it? It's Haram. It's a variation of, 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 the, of the name Hiram. Oh, yeah. So his first ancestor is Hiram Abiff, who's a major character in the Masonic stories. I mean, again, this it There's can't no be a coincidence. That's a coincidence. Yeah, yeah, that's too perfect. Too perfect, absolutely. And what is Hiram? He's the builder of the temple. So essentially, the course of human history is the building of King Solomon's temple in symbol. It's the building of man, the temple of humanity, the perfection of humanity. And for those who are able to delve into this from a symbolical point of view, this is why Herbert is telling this story from the point of view of imperial conflict because he's using the building of empires and the persistence of great houses and great families as a metaphor for this temple building. Because at least in my mind, the symbol of, of building the temple of humanity can be fit into any vessel. It's building up an idea. And each of these great houses represents an idea that's being perpetuated across time and space. Like archetypes, yes. Like archetypes, and that is what masonry does. It perpetuates ideals across time and space for the moment 
many, many thousands of years in the future when they will become necessary, like the Bene Gesserit with the Missionaria Protectiva. They project religion into the future at a point where it will, be, it will mature and become useful, the same way that masonry was the projection of, say, Enlightenment ideals centuries before their time so that they would persist to when they would be able to be manifested. But what I think is critical in all the books of Dune is this idea that safety is death, peace is death, war is evolution. And I'm not saying war in a, in a literal sense, but in a metaphoric sense. Conflict. Conflict. Difficulty. Difficulty. You know, and that brings me to something I, I can never talk about Dune and not bring up the Gam Jabbar. Because this, this idea is introduced in this story immediately with the tale of the Gam Jabbar. Well, not really the tale, but the scene of the Gam Jabbar. Oh, so it's a tale. It, it certainly is a tale. So just to recap it, um, right at the beginning of the book, uh, Paul Atreides at this point is 15 years old. He's been trained uh, kind of against the will of the Bene Gesserit by his mother. And so the Bene Gesserit have dispatched the mother superior, Gaius Helen Mohayim, to test the child, to see if he's human. Not to see if he's the Kwisatz Haderach, but to see if he's human, which I think is an, an interesting point that Herbert makes, is that not all human beings are fully human. And the Bene Gesserit recognize this with a test called the Gom Jabbar. So the Gom Jabbar, it, it's not actually the name of the test, it's the name of the of part of the test, but it consists of placing your hand in a box that simulates the worst possible pain your body can experience. It's like it's described as having the flesh burned away from the bone on his hand. And while this is happening, the mother superior is holding a needle of deadly poison to his neck. And if he flinches or pulls away from this test, he'll be killed instantly, proving that he was an animal and not a human. This is our initiation in Freemasonry. The things that are done to us is a Gam Jabbar. The entire lodge is a Gam Jabbar, I think. We're, the, the masonry is testing us to see if we're actually human. Are we worthy to partake in the mysteries of ancient Freemasonry? If we can't survive those trials, then we're just profane and we should exit the temple and never look back. Or do you think I'm being too harsh? No, I, I completely agree with you. In fact, I think that it's almost... I envy the initiates of millennia ago who who under underwent real trials. I mean, like, not to say that our experience is is lesser, but it certainly isn't what was happening in ancient Egypt when you had to, you know, cross pits of crocodiles and, and, and really confront your fears in a in a physical, visceral sense, the way that it's described with the test of the Gom Jabbar. It's done in symbol now and we keep as much of that spirit alive as possible. But it, the world is different. We you know, we can't hold you know, vials of poison to people's necks anyway. Like, that's that's just not something... Why can... not? <laughs> <laughs> Federal health and safety <laughs> regulations. Oh. <laughs> Little thing called the law. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but I, I think it's really fascinating, the concept that the test of being fully human is to sort of overcome your animal desire to flee pain. Uh, that's that's really a critical point. Well, there's an interesting line from this part of the book. It's in the first couple of pages. I think the Mother Superior says it that has always stuck with me. She's describing to Paul what makes somebody uh, human as opposed to animal. And she says, if an animal is caught in a trap, it'll gnaw its own leg off to escape the trap. If a human is caught in a trap, it will pretend to be trapped so to eliminate the trapper and eliminate a threat to his species. That's the difference is that a human being is willing to undergo pain and difficulty in order to solve a problem, whereas an animal runs away at the first sign of confrontation. Right. Yeah, so the whole thing is really about becoming more than what we think of as human per se. It's really about transcending all of the things that the past, the, the momentum of the past that exists in our instincts and our genes towards some higher purpose, which may be painful, uh, which is painful, in fact, uh, but which we must go through and must uh, proceed on to our destiny in some sense. Well, and Freemasonry starts from the same assumption. It doesn't assume that the people that are initiated are human fully. We are always working to a fuller humanity in masonry. We never think that our humanity is complete at any particular stage. It's an ongoing process of work and transformation. This reminds me of 
the tests they've done recently with children in terms of delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. Do you want one donut right now, or are you willing to wait an hour and have two donuts? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like this is like a evolution. It, it's in a sense, it's a controlled evolution. You know, in a sense that you know, if you're wanting to to create the future of humanity, essentially, then you have to test for people for if they are uh, if they have whatever the trait or collection of traits are that qualify them to be a part of that future. And what do we do in masonry? Every degree has an exam. Every degree has a period of approbation, of trials, of examination. And what we're essentially doing in masonry is preparing people by various grades towards their ultimate destiny of perfection. Our problem is, as you mentioned, Brother Axel, is that we've become soft over the last 100 years, and we must restore the ancient precepts of Freemasonry by making it harder once again. It shouldn't be easy. No, what the Malecraft Masons are doing with these, uh, these mass initiations of being past raised um, in a couple oh, in a of weekend, hours on a Sunday, this yeah. is nonsense and should be eradicated from the roles of the craft. Yeah, the Fremen have a term for uh, this state of, a, of any particular society, they call it water soft. You become water soft when things are easy. The reason that the Fremen have been forged into elite warriors is because they have been surviving on messianic hope for millennia. They've been, and at, in the later books, they go into kind of the, the history of the Fremen. These are people that have been chased from planet to planet over tens of thousands of years. They've been persecuted and killed and driven out of their home in every turn. And finally, they're, they're hiding in caves on Dune, waiting for their Savior to come and lead them to victory. Right. And what is a sort of, that sort of messianic hope, but a hope for some future ideal human? I mean, in a sense, that's what messiahs always are. You know, like you could look at Jesus Christ that way, if you like, as a perfected human being uh, that it has the is realized what we all have the potential to be this is where we enter the golden path so all along we learn that paul saw down the many lines of cause and effect because that's essentially what the spice does it it, it doesn't give you a magical power it allows your mind to see cause and effect so accurately that you can with almost 100 percent assurity see the future course of humanity and what he sees is the end of humanity but because of his own flaws he fails and so then his son Leto II becomes the God Emperor and institutes a reign of tyranny for 3,000 years he what he does is he brings peace to the whole galaxy there's no conflict so brother Matthias and because I know you have an extensive theory on this why do you think it is that Paul Muad'Dib fails this test my th theory is really simple. It's love. It's, 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 he can't give up his loved one. He doesn't want to become the worm. He's not willing to make the sacrifice. Therefore, he's weak. He fails the gum jabbar. Right, yeah, he's kind of pulled down, I guess you could say, by the gravitational pull of uh, the comforts of life, uh, having a wife, having kids, living a simpler life, not guiding the uh, trajectory of humanity. Check out a movie called The Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, it's a movie in the 70s and basically depicts the same thing. It's essentially the path of the martyr, right? The, the, the choice to sacrifice everything for the holy ideal or to settle down, live the earthly life while being haunted with the knowledge that you did not do all that you could. Yeah, and this is why many uh, say that uh, his son Leto was actually the true Kwisatz Haderach, uh, that uh, Paul was not technically the Kwisatz Haderach, although he had that uh, extreme prescient ability. But really, Leto II fails too, because what happens after 3,000 years? He falls in love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of the major themes of this whole thing is the relationship of heart and mind or love and uh, intellect, I guess you could say. It's a, a really interesting theme in the book. And it's really, it's not just that love is the problem, I would say. It's that it's a particular kind of love. Because if he looked forward into the future and opened his heart to all humanity and the future of humanity love would carry him through the path but he's stuck in a more personal uh more direct 
kind of love that leads him astray from the greater love he right. should be pursuing. Lost. And this is the direction that Freemasonry pushes its initiates away from the love of self, the love of things, the love of one's immediate surroundings, its family, community, but the idea of agape, the love of all humanity at whatever cost the good of humanity demands because the love of humanity isn't always like that doesn't mean be nice to everybody. That means love the idea of the species, love the idea of humanity persisting, of humanity surviving, of humanity thriving. Sometimes that's going to take pain, difficulty, and danger. And this is what Paul shies away from for that lesser form of love. And eventually Leto II as well. Yes, that's true. And Leto can really, uh, you know, he sees even further into the future being fused with the sandworms. And he sees even a sort of distant threat in the future. And th so he directs humanity onto a golden path, which is essentially uh, through various political uh, manipulations. He forces humanity to have what is essentially a diaspora. Uh, he forces them to go out into separate parts of space and not to be under the control of the Imperium. Uh, and so they, humanity evolves in different directions. In, uh, you know, they evolves in unique traits rather than all being the same. Okay, I'm going to get weird here. I think what Leto II does is he creates the six root race that's referred to in theosophy and other traditions. It's, it's the next humanity. Because when he imposes his 3,000 years of peace, of tyranny, he says, I'm going to teach humanity a lesson they will remember in their bones. So he, he's essentially trying to alter humanity. And his tyranny, when it's done, he's created a spring in which humanity scatters, it's called the scattering, to many dimensions, to many worlds, universes, galaxies, to, to infinite amount of places so far out that you can never destroy humanity again. This is our evolution. You know, and this is something... Now that you say that, Brother Matias, that you can kind of see in early 18th century history and early Freemasonry, Freemasons in the 1700s recognized that humanity had been under pressure since the Middle Ages, right? With these old systems of monarchy persisting. A and god a, emperor. A, almost literally, literally god <laughs> emperor. Yeah. Yeah, wow. no. And so, and so yeah. what does masonry do? It takes this humanity under pressure and unleashes it in the Americas, in Europe, in South America through Simon Bolivar and the Knights of Reason Lodge out of Spain. Like that's what masonry did in the early or in the later period of the Enlightenment. It sent humanity forward on its own scattering, just like Leto II does in the later books of Dune. That's Freemasonry. Because if you think about it, what's the mission of masonry? Oh, it's charity. No, that's a relatively new idea that male craft masons do. In the 17th and 18th century, it was the revolution against monarchs, of kings and queens and, and all that nonsense that was oppressing mankind. What was it before that? Scientific revolution. Masonry has an all-time, whether we call it masonry or the, the ancient mysteries, they are combating the stagnant part of humanity at that time. So my question to you, my brothers, what is our mission today? So if we look out on the world around us, there are so many things that are stagnating right now. Politics is stagnating into left versus right. Economies are stagnating into the same old systems that have made the richest people rich. And we have to look at these and question them and try to subvert them, whether it's with technology, whether it's with the new sharing economy, whether it's with uh, just speaking out and challenging systems that have been there unquestioned. We have to... Just take a look at our world. Question what's going on. Yeah, I, I tend to agree, I, especially if I look at the rich uh, Western civil, you know, civilizations right now. Um, I mean, what a lot of people are is essentially fat and happy. You know, <laughs> they're uh, they're they're just they're they're not really all that challenged. Um, and so, you know, I think yeah, absolutely, we have to challenge that. See, I'm gonna go a little further than both of you, gentlemen. Of course. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, people are, are fat and happy and they're not challenged, but humanity is not challenged. Humanity is fat and happy. I think we need to go into space. I think the stagnation is that we've been on this rock for far too long. We need our own scattering on a magnificent scale. That's we need our to hope. get off this rock right now. 
Yeah, there's a there's an interesting uh, um, concept in the first Dune, well in the first two Dune books. Um, the Emperor has a planet. It's a prison planet called Seleucus Secundus, and this is where he recruits his uh, his elite uh, troops from. That's what Earth is. This is a test to see if we can get out of the trap that we were placed in at our creation. Can we break the chains that we don't even see around us? And how do we do that? We become something more than what we are technically evolved to be uh, so far. Yeah. And, you know, that's it's kind of the... It goes back to the golden path to the god emperor's enforced tyranny and the scattering. Because one thing you see as a theme in the books and as a theme in our world is you have rough times. They make hard men. Hard men fight and struggle and make make a better world, and then their children become soft. And the God Emperor's lesson is... And hold on, hold on. And soft men make bad hard times. times. Soft men make hard times. They make the difficulties that produce the hard men again. So with the Emperor's tyranny, he builds it into our bones that we will never again crave soft times. And that is something we need to figure out how to do to humanity. Because if you look at the, the purely political situation right like yes we should question everything around us certainly but masonry freed us in quotes from that tyranny 300 years ago and what have we done we've run right back to it right. we had freedom at the end of the 18th century or at least the beginnings of it but what did we do we surrendered it piece by piece we didn't learn the lesson in our bones that's why we have to do something far more dramatic than just another overthrow of the political system. But is that even possible, uh, Brother Axel? Because the God Emperor is able to do that because he can live 3,000 years. We can't live 3,000 years, so how are we going to make that lesson in our bones? But what has persisted for 3,000 years? Mysteries. The, not, masonry. Masonry. Essentially. So yeah. you're saying that masonry, that the mystery schools, that is the God Emperor, that by going through the same rituals, carrying on the same ideas, we are holding a pattern, which is the same as if a person was doing or it. Maybe more like the Bene Gesserit, really, the force that is creating this uh, evolution of humankind. The only reason that the God Emperor ever came into existence was because the Bene Gesserit were breeding traits in human beings and uh, sort of controlling, manipulating various societies and power structures in order to lead humanity along this trajectory. There's a real interesting part in the God Emperor of Dune book where all the people that serve the God Emperor, Leto II, are people that have attempted to rebel against him. He only accepts those that have a rebellious nature as his top lieutenants. So these people rebel against him, and there's, a, there's at the time of the book, his, uh, was it Major Domo, his, his mm -hmm. second in command, his name's Moneo. And Moneo was a rebel and tried to kill him. And then at the time that he tries to kill him, he takes him out in the desert and shows him the golden path shows him the end of humanity, and shows him the course, and then he becomes loyal. I think masonry does the same thing because the degrees of masonry tell a complicated history of humanity. People always think it's about King Solomon's Temple. That's part of the story of masonry. But this, the story of masonry goes over thousands of years, and by the end of it, what are we being taught? The golden path, the end of humanity, how we can survive this and protect against our own destruction. We must become Fremen again, Brother Matthias. We've become water soft. Weak. Weak. We have to return to the, the wind-stricken plains of Arrakis once more. Face the desert. You see, the danger to humanity never really went away. You know, we've built up this wonderfully comfortable civilization, this technological system by which our, our needs are answered, our wants are satisfied, but we are not satisfied. The soul of humanity is not satisfied unless it is in conflict. And by pushing it away to the corners of our awareness, we have distanced ourselves from our Fremen roots. We have to return to that. We have to shed our water softness again. We need to be able to sit in the lodge for four hours without moving. We need chambers of reflection with snakes. We need fire. We need water. We need air. We need earth suffocating us to death. Because right now, uh, a lot of Masonic orders, they're just aping the motions of the past. Like in the books, uh, when Leto the, uh, second does his peace, he enforces, you know, enforces an end to conflict. He builds everyone up to a reasonable level of prosperity, and they get, as Brother Axel said, water fat. But one thing he does uh, is he preserves the ancient ways of the Fremen 
as ritual. So they're no longer driven by survival. They're no longer driven by the pressures of environment, but he makes them ape exactly everything they did. So they were preserving the rituals, but without the, without the substance, without the danger, without the real meaning. But he did that so that when the time came, the real meaning could be restored to the ritual. Sound familiar? I mean, we are the Fremen. Co-Masonry is the Fremen. And it's interesting, too, Herbert, I don't, I don't know exactly um, what his intention here was, but in the Fremen society, men and women are equal. There's no gender distinction among the Fremen. Men and women fight side by side. They take spice side by side. They do everything side by side cooperatively, just as we do in Comasery. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we're going to be running down the shield wall with our Chris knives waving in the air, but <laughs> we certainly are here to restore a little bit of that visceral, physical reality to the mysteries. Something I want to bring up, I want to get everyone's opinion on this. So... There's a character called Dunk in Idaho. Mm. And in the first book, I mean, he dies at the beginning. But he's brought back in the second book as a Gola or a clone. And then he's brought back in the third book. Well, he's not, no, excuse me. He's still alive in the third book. Right. But then he's dead again. And then you find out that the God Emperor has been cloning him throughout 3,000 years. And Duncan gets pissed off, and the God Emperor kills him and then clones another one because he loves Duncan. He's as good at Trades. And as the books go on, he's the only character in every single book. I think maybe the key is in Duncan. Well, and it's interesting because he's not an Atreides. He's the only main protagonist that's not an Atreides, but he's a servant to the Atreides cause throughout time. That, that's why the God Emperor brings him back. It's not because he carries any specific genetic markers or anything like that. It's because... Duncan was so committed to the idea of the Atreides. He is a foot soldier of preserving the idea. He's not necessarily the Atreides with the wild talent himself, but he recognizes this so-called wild talent of the Atreides and wants to see it persist into the future, like masonry. And in this capacity, he's almost like a benchmark because, as you say, his loyalty is to the Atreides. So to the extent to which someone has the Atreides qualities, so will be his loyalty. And let's, let's talk a bit about those Atreides qualities. What do the Atreides symbolize? Because, you know, we're Masons. We're all about that symbolism. So what do the Atreides symbolize? Well, they're certainly the noblest house, in a sense, I would say. Well, what's interesting is that House Atreides and House Harkonnen are not that different from one another. And you actually come to find out that a lot of the characters have been bred by the Bene Gesserit, from both sides. Unbeknownst to them. Unbeknownst to them. So they're fighting each other, but they're really the same people. And I think you, you, you get this concept of yin and yang. And I think you're absolutely right, Brother Axel, that Duncan, he's really outside of it. He, he's faithful, but he's outside of it. He is loyal, but doubting. And so I think Duncan represents humanity. Yeah. He's the reincarnation of a human being over and over again as they learn their trials in life. And he has the qualities of the Atreides, but he also has the qualities of a Harkonnen. And what happens is, is that those are refined over time towards a great destiny. And I think that destiny is the perfection of humanity. It's not a messiah. It's not a, a god emperor. It is an average man. Yeah, and I mean, speaking to the sort of what the what the uh, Atreides represent, and while we're at it, what the Harkonnens represent, uh, they're essentially polarities within mankind. Uh, the, the Atreides are very noble, and uh, they they are have high ideals, let's say, and uh, you know uh, they were what we would consider the good guys. And the Harkonnens are very uh, oriented towards sense gratification. They're very animalistic, mm -hmm. and so in a way, this interbreeding of the uh, Atreides and Harkonnens is like uh, the combination of the higher aspects of the human with the lower animal aspects. I think that's relevant. It's like the Atreides and the Harkon, like you say, are short-term and long-term. Like, the Atreides are always thinking into the future, into thinking, if I treat these people well now, they will be loyal to me later. The Harkonnens are thinking, what can I get out of these people right now?
Well, and, and too, if we look at Duncan's origin, especially in the light of, you know, this idea of the Harkonnens and the Atreides as opposite polarities, Duncan grows up on Gidi Prime, the home planet of the Harkonnens, running from the Harkonnens from his childhood. He hates the Harkonnens because they inflicted um, great pain and violence on him as a child. So it's almost like humanity in its infancy remembers the folly of its own base nature that by it it's like humanity understands that by indulging in its base nature by by submitting to the rule of the base nature we set ourselves up for a future of violence and of slavery but by recognizing the higher idea by serving the higher house the more noble house of the atreides that that is a path forward into the future but when you reject the senses and you reject um those parts of us that we may consider base and try to suppress them, what do you get? You have the downfall of the Atreides because the Harkonnens did destroy them in the first Dune book. With their own, by using their own nobility. Exactly. This is the conflict of the polarities, and it's a conflict that happens within each of us. Yeah. Which is why it's essential that Duncan stands apart and in the middle, right? Because he's each of us, That's right. in my opinion. And constantly undergoing deaths and rebirths. And eventually learns how to remember his past lives, which is an interesting aspect, I think. I, I agree, Brother Jonathan. I think we should get into this as the last part of our podcast. Genetic memory. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like an idea of reincarnation, but it's more of a scientific idea. And I know recently in a lot of scientific tests and genetics, they know that we can store genetically memories. So this concept that Frank Herbert wrote about decades ago uh, wasn't science fiction. It's actually true. And there may be some ability to access prior memories of our ancestors by some mastery of genetics. Well, and from the Masonic point of view, or at least from my point of view as this relates to Masonry, Masonry is like the symbolic memory of humanity. There's the literal genetic memory of humanity. And then that masonry serves as almost like a repository for all of the symbols, all of the interpretations, all of the meaning that humanity has generated as sacred throughout its existence. And it exists to preserve that for the time when it can be awakened by one who can see it all. Because I think it's true, certainly of the male craft orders, but also of, of our own, we don't know what we have. We are sitting on the treasure trove of humanity. It's like it's the inheritance of humanity. And we're not necessarily using it to, the, to its fullest capabilities. But eventually, somewhere in our bones, we know someone or something will come along that will know what to do with this information. And for that reason, we have kept it safe for thousands of years. Think about it. In every degree... The candidate, the neophyte, represents a different personality, a different personage. We're representing people in history. We become those. And as we move to degrees, we're representing different people from the past. What does this sound like? Memory. Memory. Call it genetic memory. Call it reincarnation. It's the same thing, really. It's just two different perspectives. One mystical, one scientific. But masonry has both. And what we're doing is preserving these important personages as we move through the unfolding of our own nature. Right, it's like we're transcending time and that's again an, an important element of the Dune series is the ability to transcend time either by remembering through genetic memory or through prescience to peer into the future. That seems to be what uh, Frank Herbert is saying is an essential aspect of what will be required for us to evolve and to become more than we have been. That evolution that you're talking about Brother Jonathan is what these books are about and and what makes these books so amazing is that evolution isn't one thing it's science it's politics it's religion it's philosophy it's psychology i can't think of a book series that's able to blend all of those so harmoniously as the dune series frank herbert is a master and i can i can say that this is my most favorite book series ever written because it is biblical in its nature. And we're going to leave everyone with a final thought of beauty, a quote from the Dune series. Excellent. So this is my favorite Dune quote of all time, uh, and I think it really is relevant to masonry and encapsulates everything we've been talking about. And the quote is this. 
Seek freedom and become captive of your desires. Seek discipline and find your liberty. Thank you for listening to Legends of the Craft. This podcast is purely the opinion of brothers Matthias Concier and Axel Suvari and does not represent the official views of Universal Comesory. Universal Comesory is a Masonic order founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity that admits men and women without distinction of race, religion, or creed. For more information, please visit universalfreemasonry.org.